I think it's time for the webinar today. So I would like to introduce the, our speaker yeah, for all our audience. Hello, good morning and uh, good evening. Uh, I am P.Y. Cho and my college, uh, Dr. Junior Tu, we both will moderate the webinar today. Uh, welcome to ICC webinar. Dr. Subakit Pianchen Latkajon is currently an associate professor in the Department of Orthodontics, a faculty of dentistry, Mahirdo University. He is one of a handful of orthodontists in the world who is duly certified by the American Board of Orthodontics and uh, the American Board of Dental Sleep Medicine. Dr. Yeah, Subakit yeah, obtained his dental degree from Mahiro University. He went on to complete his orthodontic residency training and the Master of Science from the University of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He then finished a fellowship program in surgical orthodontics and the craniofacial anomaly from UT Southwestern, where he later served as a program director. While in Dallas, he was appointed a clinical assistant professor, both at the Bader and the UT Southwestern. He was also an adjunct clinical assistant professor oh, in the department of the PRS at Stanford University. Dr. Superkid was the orthodontic director at the Dallas Children's, where he treated the children born with complex mouth occlusion, cleft lip and palate, craniofacial mouth formation, and a spatial needs. Prior to relocating to Bangkok, he was the owner of Howard Braces, an orthodontic and a dental sleep medicine practice in the San Francisco Bay Area and a member of the CLEP craniofacial team at the Kaiser System, Northern California. Dr. Supaki has published numerous scientific papers in the topics of CLEP craniofacial anomaly and dental sleep medicine. He also lectured in Thailand, United States, and internationally. Today, we are so honored to have Professor Supaki with us to present the topics, treatment of the obstructive sleep apnea, the emergence, the role of orthodontics. Also, two experienced experts are invited to the panel, Professor Clement Chen Hui Lin, and the Professor Yu Fang Liao, and they both from Chang'e Memorial Hospital. Can't wait to learn from Professor Supaki and the Professor. Please, thank you. Thank you for such a kind introduction. So I, I assume I have to share the screen again, is that right? Yes, correct. Please. Okay, let me go ahead and do that first. All right, can everybody see the screen coming on? Is that right? Yes, okay. Okay, perfect. All right, again, uh, thank you for having me today. I'm very, very honored. I'm, the big fan, I'm a big fan of the Changgang Memorial uh, Cleft Korean Facial Center. I've been there a couple of times and I've you know, learned a lot, not just from um, you know, the forum and the meeting, but also from various you know, publications that you guys put out. Um, over the past, you know, few decades. So uh, the topic of my presentation today is treatment of obstructive sleep apnea and emerging role of um, orthodontics. Um, so as in the introduction that I'm an orthodontist, I, I you know, completed my residency training and then I went on to do a cleft craniofacial fellowship at UT, uh, Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas at uh, Dallas Children Medical Center. It was actually there that I, you know, began to um, become interested in, you know, caring for a patient with uh, obstructive sleep apnea. Just a, 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 you know, a little bit of my work history. Um, so let's just uh, dive in. So. 
Um, for those of you who may not be, uh, you know, familiar or completely familiar with obstructive sleep apnea, it is uh, a chronic disease. It occurs when the upper airway is uh, partially or completely obstructed during sleep. So when you sleep, you are in a different position. You lie down, you have gravity that, you know, starts to pull your soft palate, jugular, and, you know, base of tongue toward the back of your throat. So the pharyngeal airway get encroached and become a little bit smaller. And on top of that, your muscle physiology is quite different when you sleep. You don't have such an you know, active muscle tone, especially in REM sleep, you barely have any muscle tone at all. And all of that make the um, airway, which is a soft tissue tube, become much more collapsible because the airway, as I said, a soft tissue tube that doesn't have any support from you know, cartilage or bone. Um, you know, for today's lecture, I'm going to focus on just pediatric sleep apnea. Um, 40, 45, 40 or 45 minutes is obviously not enough to go into all of this. So the focus today will be pediatric sleep apnea. So if left untreated, uh, children with obstructive sleep apnea can experience delayed growth. You, for those of you who, you know, see uh, this type of patient, sometimes you can, you can kind of see that they come in quite tiny um, compared to kids of the similar age. In addition to that, they can also have impaired neurodevelopment. They can have cardiovascular dysfunctions. They can have neurocognitive uh, dysfunctions. For signs and symptoms of a patient with a pediatric OSA, the clinical presentation may be different from those of adult. They do have, you know, loud breathing noise. They, you know, also snore, but they presented with more of a behavioral problem rather than the excessive daytime sleepiness that we see in adult patients. They get agitated easily, they get irritated easily, they have low threshold to you know, express their negative emotion, they become hyperactive. They have short span attention, or they have you know, poor concentration, and all of this can lead to a pretty poor academic performance. They often wet their beds, or in you know, some, um, some extreme cases, they can get severe you know, clinical depression, they, they can get withdrawn from society in general. In terms of diagnosis, the current gold standard is to perform an overnight polysomnogram, or um, you know, we refer it sometimes as a sleep study. As you can see on the picture on the left side of the screen, you, know, you go to a hospital or a sleep lab, you spend a night there, you get hooked up to lines and, and cables and all that. And you know, it will monitor your breathing, your brain wave, and all that. And you know, eventually you get a sleep report. Okay. Um, so um, I want to introduce two terms for those who are not familiar with obstructive sleep apnea. The first term is apnea. Apnea is basically temporary cessation of the airflow that lasts 10 seconds or longer. It can be um, obstructive central omics. Again, I, I just don't have enough time to go into all of that. The second term that I want to introduce is hypopnea. Hypopnea as opposed to apnea is basically a partial reduction of the airflow. Either apnea or hypopnea, it actually have to last 10 seconds for them to be counted as apnea hypopnea. And when we um, count them all together, all these you know, events that took place as you sleep in the night, when we count them all and then average them by the hour, we get apnea hypopnea index. And the reason that I had to introduce this term is because I want to talk about the diagnosis for pediatric OSA. And this means that children up to 18 years of age an AHI of zero to one is considered normal. An AHI of one to five, it's considered as mild um, OSA. Five to 10 is moderate. And an AHI of more than 10 per hour, it's considered severe. And etiology is a combination. Um, the most common one is soft tissue enlargement, specifically the uh, adenotonsillar hypertrophy. But also you get reduction in the size of bony compartments, such as maxillary or mandibular hypoplasia. And in the extreme cases, all those 
you know, craniofacial syndromes. And of course, it could be a combination of the soft tissue enlargement and the, and the reduction of the bony um, compartments. If we look at the prevalence of OSA in patients with craniofacial anomalies, you will see that um, basically they're extremely high. If you look at all those, you know, syndrome on the left, for instance, the craniosynosis syndrome, the prevalence is as high as 75% or, you know, Pierre Robin sequence is almost 73%. And um, the patient that you see on the right of the screen, um, she was diagnosed with both Pierre Robin sequence and severe OSA with an AHI of 27. And all of that information, all of that information is very crucial in treatment planning because you not only want to address their occlusion, their facial aesthetics, but you want to make sure that they're able to breathe well as well. So because of the multifactorial nature of pediatric OSA, that means that um, the optimal treatment will require a multidisciplinary team. And typically the team will consist of a primary care physician or pediatricians, and they will be the one who refer patients to a sleep physician to perform a sleep test. Now, um, the physician, the sleep physician, their duty is not only to perform the sleep test, but also to um, deliver treatment such as CPAP as well. Um, but you also get ENT or pediatric ENT or in you know, some institution, you have pulmonologists, you have neurologists, and of course the you know, plastic surgeon and maxillofacial surgeon are also crucial parts because we are talking about you know, reduction in bony size. And as an orthodontist, I'm trying, I'm here trying to convince you that we actually play, you know, a pretty significant role in, you know, treating uh, this type of patients as well. So um, let's first um, take a look at the uh, dental arch and craniofacial morphology of uh, children with obstructive sleep apnea. There are four major characteristics that we, were, that we are able to identify. The first one is narrow and constricted maxilla and high vaulted palate. This is also known as transverse maxillary discrepancy. These patients also presented as mandibular retinacea or mandibular hypoplasia. And we also see that many of them have mandible, high mandibular plane angle. Mandibular plane High mandibular plane angles signify vertical direction of mandibular growth. So instead of growing forward in a sagittal dimension, it does grow vertically. So when the mandible grow vertically, it just doesn't carry forward the base of the tongue with it. Therefore, the patient is likely to have a reduced size of the airway. And the last characteristic that we see is maxillary hypoplasia, but I'm talking specifically in the sagittal direction. So typically this type of patient could have angle, class three, malocclusion or anterior uh, cross bite. So let's take a look at um, a couple patients as an example. This guy is my patient here in uh, Bangkok, and he is a 14-year-old male with moderate OSA with an AHI of, let's just say, eight. You could see, though, that the upper jaw is very, very narrow. It's, it's very constricted with high vaulted palate, and when you look at occlusion, you see a large overjet, and you see that the shin is very recessive, and that, that just you know, indicates that he has mandibular retronatia, um, and on top of that, if you look at cephalogram, he has a very obtuse um, man mandibular plane angle, and that is the high mandibular plane angle that I was talking about earlier. The other patient that I like to show is uh, this little guy here. He was 10 years old when he came to see us. He had entered crossbite with maxillary hypoplasia. In addition to that, he also had uh, several missing teeth. He actually had a condition called oligodontia, um, which is also one of the risk factor, but we just don't have enough time in, we just don't have enough, have enough time to go into all of that. 
And in addition to his, you know, craniofacial uh, structures and dental characteristic that you see, he was also diagnosed with mild um, pediatric obstructive, obstructive sleep apnea with an AHI of four. In terms of treatment, the current treatment paradigms are, uh, you know, pretty much this following treatment. Adenotonsillectomy right now it's considered as the first line therapy for the treatment. CPAP obvious, obviously is used along with medications, um, but I'm gonna you know talk more in detail regarding rapid palatal or rapid maxillary expansion and also the functional jaw orthopedic treatment, and I'll touch on a little bit about the uh, MMA or maxillomandibular advancement as well. So adenotonsillectomy, as I mentioned briefly, that it is currently considered as you know, first line treatment. It is efficacious, however, it's not perfect. The success rate is roughly 50% if the post-operative AHI is less than 10, and basically that is cure. But the success rate goes up to 80% if AHI is less than five. Basically, you still have some residual left with you know, what's considered to be mild um, OSA. And non-obese uh, patients typically tend to respond better compared to the obese patients. CPAP. Um, so, you know, CPAP, it's consider one of the gold standard for treating an adult OSA along with um, auto appliance therapy. Um, for CPAP, you know, in adult, we see a lot of issue with compliance and poor adherence. The situation is a lot worse in pediatric patients. The adherence supposed to, is reported to be just 49%. So, Typically, CPAP is reserved for syndromic patients or those that you know, have persistent OSA after adenotonsillectomy. Now let's talk about my favorite treatments, orthodontics. So uh, the first treatment is um, RPE or RME. I'm gonna use the acronym. Um, so typically an RME or RPE is indicated in growing children with narrow and constricted maxilla with high vaulted palate with or without posterior crossbite. The fact that you have uh, narrow maxilla doesn't always mean that you need to get posterior crossbite because it simply means that you can have narrow mandible as well. Um, RPE is typically used to increase palatal width, intercanine width, or intermolar width. And because it does expand the palate, we can use that extra space that we gain from an RPE to resolve dental crowding. Um, so for the orthodontic audience, you could, you probably a little bit more familiar with using RPE um, to, you know, turn an extraction case into a non-extraction case in you know, one of those borderline uh, extraction cases. RP is often used in conjunction with uh, functional jaw orthopedic appliance to correct maxillary hypoplasia or mandibular hypoplasia. There are several types of palatal expander, not all of them or not all of them are RPE or RME. The one that you see on the far left of the screen is a removable appliance with a jack screw in the middle. This is basically an expansion plate. This can move teeth, but it doesn't work on sleep apnea patients, or at least we don't have any evidence for that. The quad helix that you see in the middle is the same as the removable plate. We don't use it to correct um, OSA. Just the one on the far right of the screen um, basically, you can see that it is a fixed appliance. In this case, it's attached to the teeth. And you see that there is a, a, a jack screw in the middle that can deliver a heavy load of force, enough to push the palatal shelf apart, enough to stretch the palatal suture. That is the one that I'm talking about. And there are several designs. It can be banded like the one in the middle, or it can be bonded with you know, um, acrylic. Uh, all these different indications, I just don't have enough to go into it today. 
But again, for RPE or RME that we use for the purpose of treating patient with pediatric sleep apnea, we are gonna use the one that has fixed design with jack screw in the middle that can deliver a heavy load of force. So for RPE, it does stretch the palatal suture and uh, it pushes the palatal shelf apart. The, uh, the top row that you see, it's basically an illustration. And um, the middle row is an occlusal films that shows that the RP is being activated. As the RP is being activated, you can see that there is a space being created in the middle. And that is how we stretch the palatal suture and push the palatal shelf apart. Typically, we leave an RPE in place after the activation for about four to six weeks. And the reason we do that is because after we activate, there is basically a space right in the middle, as you can see in the bottom row with the CT scan, that there is a space there. And about four to six months after the activation, the you know, body will um, create bone to fill in that gap. And that's how we expanded the palatal shelf. And that's how we you know, created a wider uh, palate. So how does an RPE helps alleviate pediatric sleep apnea? We think that there are three uh, potential uh, treatment mechanism. The first one is that the RPE increased nasal cavity volume that results in a reduction of nasal resistance. And also the RPE can increase the pharyngeal airway volume. And um, the last mechanism is that the RPE can change the tongue position to make it assume a more posterior position. So let me, uh, you know, dive into further detail of all this. So even the name suggests that the expansion happened at the palate level, but in reality, the expansion of the suture stretches all the way up to frontal nasal sutures or even frontal maxillary sutures. So we're not really just expanding the palate, but we actually expanding the entire nasal maxillary complex. This uh, study published uh, in 2006 by Bob McCann and colleagues, they show that um, the nasal cavity volume increases about 15% after an RPE. And because of that, it does allow a significantly increased volume of air to pass through the nasal cavity. And that actually um, allowed the airway to be kept patent. In addition, um, a study by Fast Tuka in 2015, he does the CBCT and um, he used it to assess the uh, airway volume before and after an RPE. And he found that there is approximately 30% increase of the uh, pharyngeal airway volume at all level, upper airway, middle airway, and lower airway. As well as, in, uh, as well as the total airway volume, there is a, an approximately 30% increase. There is a similar study um, published in the same year. They actually used a different measurement technique. In this study, they use a computational fluid dynamics to measure airway flow fields. And the results are similar. They do see a significant increase of the pharyngeal airway in um, patients following the use of an RPE. Um, in regard to the tongue position, um, this study expanded um, the palate in growing patients. And what they found is that the tongue position assume a more posterior, I'm sorry, assume a more um, superior position following an RPE. And as the tongue assume a more superior position, it does bring the back of the tongue or um, genital glosses uh, forward along with it. And therefore you get an increase in airway dimension. So those are the three possible mechanisms that we think that it could explain why an RPE can alleviate an OSA. 
So now let's take a look at uh, clinical efficacy of RPE. Currently, there are actually a pretty good number of studies now. Um, however, most of them are um, a retrospective and a prospective study. I myself is actually attempting to do um, an RCT, a randomized clinical trial using an RPE to you know, to treat uh, children with um, moderate obstructive sleep apnea, but that's still, you know, a couple years down the road. But, um, you know, instead of looking at all these individual um, studies, let's take a look at two system systematic reviews and meta-analysis. The first one was published in 2017 by commercial and colleagues. They were able to identify 17 studies. They had an N of uh, 314 and a mean age of let's just say seven and a half and all these patients they do have OSA along with uh, narrow maxilla. They divided patients into two groups. The first group had a follow-up of less than three years. Um, the AHI went down from 8.9 to 2.7 and that represents a 70% reduction. In addition, they identified patients who had previous history of adenotonsillectomy, as well as those who basically doesn't have a uh, uh, large tonsil or uh, significantly, uh, uh, significantly hypertrophy of the adenotonsillar tissue. So in those cases, they observed 73 to 95% reduction compared to only 61% reduction in patients that had large tonsil or significant adenotonsillar hypertrophy. The uh, other group, they uh, had patients who had a follow-up of more than three years. Um, the AHI went down from 7.1 to 1.5, and that represents 79% uh, reduction. The overall kill rate is uh, approximately 25%, and they also reported an increase, a significant increase of the LSAT as well. So that was the first uh, systematic review, as I mentioned, published in 2017. The second study was published in, in 20, 2020, just a little more recent. They identified seven studies with an N of 94. The average age is six and a half. Again, they divided patients into two groups. The first one is less than a less than three year follow-up. They had a you know, pre-treatment HI of 8.4 and after RPE, the HI went down to about three. Um, and that represents 73% reduction. And the other group that had more than three years of a follow-up, they have 77% reduction from 12 to two. So those are basically published data in international journals. Here is our experience here in Bangkok. We started collecting data a couple of years ago. Uh, we, first of all, it's a retrospective study, so it may not be, you know, exactly apple to apple comparison, um, but we compare um, two groups. The first group had RPE and the other group had uh, adenotonsillectomy. Um, in the beginning, uh, pre-treatment AHI of the RPE group, it's about 10.7. Um, the adenotonsillectomy group is 18.1. However, um, because of the difference standard deviation, so there is no statistical difference. And after treatment, um, the AHI in the RPE group went down to five, whereas the AHI in the adenotonsillectomy group went down to three. Again, there is no statistical difference. And as I said, these are um, you know, retrospective data. So you kind of have to take with a grain of salt, but we certainly do see an improvement in our own set of data as well. So let's um, take a look at some of a few cases as examples. So the first case is the five-year-old male patient. He presented with loud breathing noise. He snores and he, you know, woke up gasping and choking a couple, several times a night. He was a preterm baby. Being a preterm is also a risk factor. He had allergic rhinitis, and also he presented with moderate adenotonsil 
adenotonsillar hypertrophy. And he was diagnosed with an AHI of 5.6 or a moderate OSA. You can see that the upper arch is uh, narrow and he has a high voltage palate. So he was referred to us and we performed an RME. This is after the activation, we expanded about seven millimeters and you can see you know, the separation between the two uh, central incisor or diastema that that's sort of an indication that the palatal shell were pushed apart and that the palate were expanded. And uh, you can see before and after, the uh, before picture is on top, you can see that the arch was narrower and then the after picture, you can see that the arch become wider. But what's more important is that the post-treatment AHI is now down to two and it's become symptom free. The second patient is all, it's a four-year-old male patient. They, he, he basically presented with, you know, similar clinical presentation, similar symptoms. He snored, had sleep fragmentation, choking. He, uh, he had a bad wetting, but his AHI is significantly more severe. He has an AHI of 17. So he was diagnosed with a severe OSA. When you look at his maxilla, you can see that narrowness and also high vaulted palate as well. So we expanded him and he responded very, very well. In this case, the AHI went down to two. Um, keep in mind that the first case had moderate adenotonsillectomy, whereas in this case, he doesn't have adeno. Uh, sorry, the first case has moderate adenotonsillar hypertrophy. And in this case, there is no um, significant adenotonsillar hypertrophy involved. So the patients responded to the treatment better. The uh, last case of this set is a 14 year old female. She uh, presented with the severe OSA. She has an AHI of 10. When you look at her jaw structure, you can see that extreme narrowness. Her, her teeth are very you know, protruding. She had lip incompetence. Um, she actually came to us for a second opinion because the first um, orthodontist that she went to wanted to extract all her first bicuspid. But wait, look at the panorex. She also had uh, an impacted uh, uh, lower left first by cuspid as well. And that was probably the reason why the first orthodontist that she went to see recommended for by extraction, because obviously this will make the treatment much easier. You just have to close the space. But if you did that, I think there is a pretty good chance that her OSA will become significantly worsened. So when she came to see me, I you know, proposed a non-extraction treatment plan, expanded her palate, and also uh, tried to salvage that impacted tube. And this is her post-treatment picture. Um, you can see that dentally she's you know, perfectly class one now. Um, the, the facial aesthetic has improved significantly as well. The protrusion of the teeth is gone. The lip incompetence that she had in the beginning is gone. We we actually able to save that lower left first bicuspid, and more importantly, she's symptom free and her AHI is three. So let's next talk about functional appliances. Um, functional appliances traditionally used to promote mandibular growth, and it does so by inducing condylar growth of the mandible. However, in comparison to an RPE, there are not that many studies that attempt to show the efficacy of functional appliances to treat pediatric OSA. But um, we are going to look at a few. The first study is actually a study using a twin block. This is actually a study from West Virginia by uh, Dr. Nan. Um, in this study, they recruited uh, 46 patients with a mean age of uh, 9.7 years. Uh, all of them were diagnosed with mandibular electronature and um, severe OSA. The initial AHI was 14. Um, and then they you know, made these patients 
were uh, twin block for about 11 months. And then after 11 months, they perform another sleep test. And then um, th what this study show is that the HIA went down from 14 to 3.4 in a year. So that's a, a significant reduction and it was able to get the patient from um, severe to a mild. Let's uh, look at an example of a case. This is an eight-year-old boy who came to see us. Unfortunately, he came with a severe OSA. His initial HI was uh, 25. His upper jaw is quite narrow and in addition to that, he also had mandibular retronature. So we started the treatment with an RPE. We um, expanded his upper jaw. And after the expansion, we performed a sleep test. This doesn't always happen, but the parents are you know, very, very enthusiastic and they you know, very involved. So this makes the treatment goes very well. Anyhow, we performed a sleep test after an RPE. So the sleep test was down to nine from 25. So a significant improvement. However, he's still nine is still nine. That is still close to severe. And, you know, he still have some symptom remain. And when you look at his occlusion, he still have large overjet with mandibular retronature. So we decided to make him a twin block. Now with the twin block on, um, a new sleep test is performed and his AHI is now down to 1.6 and all those you know, um, significant clinical symptoms are gone. The other study of uh, functional appliances that I want to highlight is the use of HERP study. Um, in this particular study, they had 16 patients. The mean age is 12.4, uh, a couple years older than the previous study with the twin block. And all of them had um, moderate OSA and mandibular retronature. The treatment began with an RPE and then uh, followed by, you know, herbs. Um, in this particular study, they didn't use AHI, but they, they reported an RDI. Basically, it's just another metrics to measure the severity, and we use it sometimes interchangeably with um, an AHI, although in my opinion, I think RDI is more sensitive than AHI. In this study, the uh, number began, the pretreatment number was 7.1, and then about a year in about a year after treatment, they perform another, another follow-up sleep test and the average um, AHI is now down to 1.3. An example of a case here at Mahidon is that uh, we got this 12-year-old guy who came to see us. He had, I'm gonna call this, uh, you know, class two, division two-ish because he doesn't have the proclination of the upper incisor. He obviously had, uh, Mandibular retronature. Um, his pretreatment, his pretreatment AHI was nine. We made him an RPE and a herbs appliance, and we kept it on for a year. And this is kind of his occlusion. When we removed the herbs appliance, you can see a pretty significant mandibular growth from using herbs. And in this case, the AHI came down to about 3.9, still mild, but fortunately he doesn't have much of the clinical symptom left and the sleep physicians were happy. So there was no further um, or no additional treatment. We're just finishing him up with orthodontic treatment right now. Um, the last uh, craniofacial characteristic is the maxillary hypoplasia. Um, typically, I think in modern orthodontic treatment, the most common treatment would be to use an RPE along with uh, protection face masks. There are uh, pretty good, you know, study that came out uh, as a series a couple years ago by Nikki Mando that documented um, the efficacy of using an RPE to treat maxillary hypoplasia or class 3 malocclusion. Um, for those who haven't read them, especially the authentic audience, I highly recommend reading them. However, um, 
in regard to the efficacy to treat an OSA patient, there is really no direct evidence. There were you know, studies that trying to measure pharyngeal airway or CT scans and all that, but none of the studies attempted to measure AHI before and after. So I'm going to use this case um, as an example to make my point. So this was an eight year old female patient presented to us with a severe OSA. This case, I treated her when I was still in Dallas and uh, her AHI, her pretreatment AHI was 51. She had a history of adenotonsillectomy. She was CPAP intolerant and she had, you know, GERD on top of that, hypothyroid control, epilepsy and seasonal allergy. She was actually referred to me by my, uh, you know, plastic surgeon uh, at the time, Craig Hobar, and he was ready to do a Lefort one distraction osteogenesis. But I said, wait, hold on here. I let me at least try to do um, an RPE face mask. And in this case, I use a technique developed or at least pioneered by Dr. Eric Liu at Changgang International called uh, alternate uh, expansion constriction. I did that about five cycles on her and put her on a face mask for about nine months. And I was able to advance her maxilla for about seven millimeters. And we did another sleep test and the AHI is now down to four and lots of her clinical symptom has improved significantly. So with this, uh, you know, treatment, I was able to, you know, avoid surgery for her. So, you know, thanks to, uh, you know, the Changgang International Fork <laughs> for this. Okay, next, let's talk about multidisciplinary approaches. Um, let's first take a look at this study. This is a study that's published about 10 years ago also by Dr. Gemino. For those who you know, work in uh, sleep medicine will probably recognize the name Dr. Gemino. It's basically considered as the founding father of pediatric sleep apnea. And uh, he was a sleep physician at Stanford. And unfortunately, I think he passed away a couple of years ago before the pandemic. Um, so he recruited 31 patients with a mean age of six and a half years. He divided them into two groups. The first group had adenotonsillectomy first. The second group had RPE first. The pretreatment AHI were um, severe in both groups. The first group had an average of 12 and a half and the second group is 11.1, but there was no status quo difference. After the first treatment, um, the first group went down to 4.9. The second group that had RPE went down to 5.4. Again, no uh, statistical significance. After um, they received the first treatment, they went on to receive the second treatment. The surgery group now will have an RPE and the RPE group now will have um, adenotonsillectomy. And after the second treatment, they perform another sleep test and the sleep test showed that they have an HI of 0.9. So at this point, they consider cure. And there's again, no um, statistical difference between the two group. I mean, identical mean, identical uh, standard deviation. So I think this systematic review um, that was published a couple years ago, uh, summarized the previous study the best. Basically, adenotonsillectomy and orthodontic treatment together, they are more effective than separately to treat pediatric OSA. There is a greater decrease in AHI and RDI, as well as a greater increase of the LSAT when to perform this two treatment together. And in addition to that, you can perform them together regardless of the treatment sequence. So you don't have to do, you know, uh, RPE first, or you don't need to do um, uh, surgery first, you can do either. Um, let's actually take a look at the case as an example. This is a nine-year-old uh, Thai boy. 
Um, he came to see us because he had significant snoring. He has uh, a pretreatment AHI of 10.1. He had significant adenotonsillar hypertrophy. You can see the, you know, the narrow arch. So we, you know, went ahead and expanded his upper jaw. Now we treated him during the pandemics. And as you can, can imagine that, you know, here in Thailand at Mahidon, we closed for uh, several months as well. I think the longest span that we closed was about four months. And because we, you know, uh, treated him during the pandemics, the follow up wasn't um, as great as we would like. So he kind of disappeared during that time. And, you know, when we, when we back, when we reopened, we, uh, you know, saw him again, but it turned out that the ENT had already took out his tonsil and adenoid. Um, so we sent him back to a, a, you know, sleep physician, and then they perform a sleep test. And it turned out that his, you know, ASI is now, is now down to 1.1, and he doesn't have any um, significant clinical symptom left. Now, another study that I like to share, I, I think this is an extremely interesting case. The, uh, it is a syndromic case called, you know, Chua's Jampo syndrome or chondrodystrophic myotonia. It's, it's a mouthful name. Um, the hallmark characteristic of this patient is that, of this syndrome, sorry, is that they, they first of all, it's very rare. I don't remember the, uh, the uh, prevalence, the, the incidence, but the hallmark characteristic is that they have intense um, and excessive muscle contraction throughout the body, including their craniofacial region. So look at the thumb right in the middle of the screen. That is actually my thumb. So you can imagine how tiny his upper jaw is. And, uh, um, he can barely open his mouth. He, we, you know, we can uh, take an impression. So we, we scan, uh, you know, his teeth. And then from the scanning, we, we fabricated the appliance. But then he, he presented to us with, you know, all those typical um, clinical presentation, the loud snoring, the gasping, the choking. But in addition to that, he had a significant morning headache. He had significant morning nausea. He had daytime fatigue and sleepiness. His pretreatment AHI was 29. They try CPAP on him and um, um, CPAP took it down to about eight. But the problem with that is they, they actually had to set the CPAP pretty high and he was not able to tolerate it. So he ended up not using the CPAP. So his symptom just doesn't improve. So he was referred to us and again, look at my thumb and, and the size of his upper jaw, how that, you know, um, contracted muscle prevented his jaw from growing. So in this case, we ended up expanding him about 14, 15 millimeters. So the pictures in the bottom row, you can see the significant, you know, difference between before and after in terms of size of the upper jaw. After the expansion, um, his AHI went down to 10. But if you put a CPAP on that, the AHI is only down to two. The difference this time is that he's able to tolerate his CPAP better because the CPAP settings just didn't have to be as high as it used to be. They were able to lower the CPAP setting and he is able to tolerate it. So now he can wear his CPAP. And when he can wear his CPAP, the AHI is down to two. He has less snoring. His uh, sleep has become more quiet. He doesn't have you know, sleep fragmentation. He have a lot less nocturia. Um, he doesn't have morning headache and nausea. And eventually his academic performances has improved as well. In addition to that, they um, injected Botox on his face and the rationale is just to reduce that muscle contraction. 
um, so that he well, hopefully his jaw will be able to grow a little bit better. And that will also make him look a little more normal. He just doesn't, you know, squint his eyes as much. He just doesn't look, you know, unusual and different from others. So moving on to the next case. This is a 13 year old male patient with a transverse maxillary, maxillary deficiency with mandibular retinacea. He presented with ankle class to mouth occlusion and he also had pretty now uh, loud snoring according to his mom. We you know, refer him to see a sleep physician and uh, they perform a sleep test on him and he had an AHI of 70, 75 and an RDI of 87, super, super severe for his age and he was only 13 years old at the time. And when you, you know, look at his jaw structure, obviously the upper jaw is very, very narrow. It looks almost like a V-shaped jaw. The, uh, you know, lower jaw is very retronactic. Uh, lots of, you know, crowding in both upper and lower. So we started off with expanding the upper jaw. Uh, you can kind of see the, you know, separation of the, the palatal shell with the appearance of the diastema. And then we put him on a twin block. And in the twin block, we designed some spring to move his teeth. He wanted his teeth to be straight if possible. So we, we added some spring to move his teeth. And also that will allow us to advance his um, mandible a little bit more as well. So with the twin block, we are able to take his HI down from 75 to 50. <laughs> but 50 is still 50. So we sent him back to see a sleep physician and then the sleep physician put him on a CPAP. And with the CPAP on, his HI is down to six. However, do you really expect that someone who is now 17 years old will be able to use CPAP and you know, some kind of auto appliance for the rest of his life. I, you know, I don't think so. So now we are talking to, you know, his family and him about, you know, performing a maxillomandibular advancement or an MMA. And basically it's a procedure that, uh, you know, we perform a Lefort one, a, a BSSO to advance the mandible and um, an advancement genoplasty. Basically we, we move them forward in a tune of eight to 10 millimeters to um, enlarge the airways. So that's the direction that I believe that we can have to be going with him um, so that we can find a more permanent solution for, um, for him. But he's not the only one. Occasionally we do have, a, a, you know, teenage patients, this, this, you know, young lady that you see here, she came to us when she was, you know, 17, 18. And again, you know, you can put her on CPAP. She had severe uh, OSA with an HI of 58, almost 60. Uh, or you can make her an auto appliance. But again, at 17, do you expect that? They, she's going to be able to do all of that until she is, what, 80, 85, 90? That just doesn't make sense. So we perform orthodontic treatment along with MMA. By the way, she also had, you know, clinical depression along with her OSA. If you see, you know, her shoulder a little bit, you will see that in the beginning, she'd like to wear black clothes. And then after treatment, after MMA and orthodontic treatment, um, first of all, you can see a significant improvement to her appearance. She looks much more beautiful. Um, and, uh, uh, the occlusion is now, you know, pretty much class one with, you know, normal overjet overbuy. And more importantly, we address her main problem. Her HI is down to about five, which she's uh, approximately 20 at this point. So, you know, HI of five, it's considered normal. And she's doing a lot better with her clinical depression as well. Um, her, you know, clothes color has changed. She, you know, began to dye her hair. Uh, and, you know, all those little things that, you know, uh, that's telling you that she's doing a little bit better. At uh, my department, we 
we not only see you know pediatric patients with OSA, we also see adult patients with OSA as well. This uh, you know patient who was seventy six years old at the time he came to see us uh, with you know moderate uh, OSA. His HI was twenty seven, but severe in REM sleep. He had uh, you know class three mild occlusion anterior cross by and uh, significant. Uh, Maxley hypoplasia. Um, initially, we wanted to see if we can just advance the maxilla only, but in this case, it also has an obstruction in the lower jaw as well after performing a drug-induced sleep endoscopy. And in the end, we adv advanced both of the maxilla and mandible, and this is how he looked. So in comparison to before treatment, I like to argue that he actually looked better and the occlusions now, you know, completely uh, socked in with maximal intercuspation and the post-treatment AHI is five, which is normal for his age. And, you know, um, if we have someone who doesn't want the surgery, we also perform um, mandibular advancement device or MAD. In this particular patient, he had, you know, moderate OSA. Um, he, didn't want to do CPAP and uh, he chose to do an auto appliance. So with auto appliance, it brought down his HI to 4.9. The little blue button that you see um, on the appliance, it's basically an um, uh, compliance indicator. So we can, we can see you know, how much he actually comply and adhere to the treatment. At least now we have a way to measure that objectively, objectively rather than relying on what patients uh, are telling us. So in summary, um, RPE has a pretty good success rate, especially in patients that doesn't that doesn't have adenotonsillar hypertrophy or those with mild adenotonsillar hypertrophy. Um, in severe cases, in uh, patients with significant adenotonsillar hypertrophy, it can at least take the severity down a notch to perhaps mild or moderate OSA. It can be performed in combination with adenotonsillectomy, regardless of the treatment sequence. It can also be performed in combination with other treatment, be it CPAP or some sort of medication. And I'd like to argue that it is a lot less invasive compared to surgery um, and no hospitalization require and probably cheaper in the long run as well. This is um, an article that I published about two years ago. So basically it talked about, you know, most of the stuff that I talked about this evening. So, you know, PubMed it or Google it if you are interested in reading a little bit further. And um, in the middle of August this year, my department at Mahidon University is going to host a conference. Uh, we're gonna invite our friends and collaborators throughout you know, Asia. Uh, we'll talk about orthodontic stuff. So I would really like to invite you know, the orthodontic audience here um, to come and visit us at Mahidon University as well as Bangkok. Um, go ahead and, and you know, scan uh, the QR code in the upper left corner of the screen and the registration site will open next month. So last but not least, once again, I would like to thank uh, Changgang uh, uh, International Cleft Corneal Facial Center for uh, inviting me to give a talk this evening. I uh, really appreciate it and thank you for your attention. All right, it's a wrap. Well, thank you very much, Professor Superkit. I think the lecture was extremely informative, and I think all of us uh, took away uh, from that lecture. Um, so without further ado, I think we'll head over to our uh, panel discussion before our Q&A session. And for first up in our panel discussion, I'd like to invite Professor Clement Lin. Professor Lin? Um, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Subakit. 
And uh, from your lecture, we learn a lot of methods from those uh, different methods. Do you have spatial algorithm or uh, any selection criteria for what kind of patient doing what kind of treatment? Especially when we talk about the uh, maxillary expansion and rapid uh, palatal expansion and sometimes the, uh, the facial mask. Um, my answer to, to your question, and, and thank you for the question, by the way, um, I think the key is, a, you know, close collabora collaboration with the sleep physician. First of all, I don't do diagnosis. I think the diagnosis is the job of the sleep physician. So we need to have that established first. I, I just don't go around, just expand anyone. And then, um, you know, once you have the diagnosis, then um, you know the. I think to some degree the uh, sleep physician will you know have a discussion with the parents and uh, um, and sometimes actually more often than not the you know parents would like to go the less invasive route. Um, so they you know refer patients to us and then we we uh, you know perform evaluation and if we think that if you know, make sense to um, expand, then we'll, we'll go ahead and expand. Basically, we'll, we'll look at the overall, um, you know, picture of the patients, their occlusion, their facial aesthetics, and then, you know, plan it accordingly. So uh, the, thank you. The, the emphasis is actually not the algorithm. The emphasis is actually the teamwork between um, the sleep physicians and, um, you know, myself. So uh, who, would, uh, who would finally decide the, the treatment option, uh, the orthodontics or uh, sleep physician? I, I would say it, 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 in the end, it's, um, it's a joint decision. I, I think the fact that you know, the sleep physician refer patients to me, that, that to some degrees is some sort of indication that you know, basically go ahead if you think this is you know, an appropriate case to, to do the expansion. And thank you. And another question for, uh, for most of us, we have uh, many cleft patients. For a patient with uh, cleft palate, Usually, they uh, they would people would uh, worry about the long term the long term stability after the expansion. Do you have some some uh, special protocol for clap patient with OSA? Uh, in clef patients, it's really not anything you know different whether they have OSA or not because they don't have palatal bone. Um, so in cleft patients, you have to do a long-term um, retention. So that means that the instruction to patients after the treatment is that you're going to have to wear retainer for the rest of your life. And you're probably going to have to be a little bit more careful um, in you know, certain patients that you think that they're not a really good compliance patient. So perhaps maybe to you know, keep the TPA in there for extra stability. If you think that makes sense, then um, I would do it. But really, um, because there is no bone, um, whether they have sleep apnea or not, the long-term stability is always going to be an issue. And that's, you know, a consideration that you have to take into for planning your retention scheme with or without sleep apnea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lin. And next, I'd like to invite Professor Liao. Hey, thank you, Professor. Your surname is difficult to pronounce. Good, good to hear from you, Dr. Liao. It has been several years since we last met. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. And I have some, thank you for your nice presentation. And I have some question for you. The first is, What's your indication of RPE for the PDH OSA? How do you define the narrow maxilla? And uh, do you perform RPE for patients with normal width maxilla? 
Um, I don't really have any number to go by. And this is a discussion that I do have with the you know, sleep physician many times because that is something that he would really like to have, that they would really like to have so they can kind of pinpoint. But the reality is that I, this is something that I'm answering based on my clinical experience rather than basing on any literature. Um, the reality is that pretty much almost 100% of these patients, they do have some degree of narrowness. And I think there are studies that show that, you know, patients with nasal obstruction in general, their uh, intercanine and intermolar width are generally narrower than the control group, those without any nasal obstruction. Um, so in, in general, um, it is just based on um, clinical presentation and just my judgment along with the diagnosis. And that's why I, I am emphasizing a, a close collaboration with the sleep physician and an orthodontist working together. And again, in those cases, the expansion amount ranges from probably somewhere between seven, eight millimeters. And in most cases, what you do is that you just increase a buccal overjet, rarely that you will create posterior buccal crossbite in patients. So do you perform RP in adult? Patients? No. No, no, no. In, in, um, so if we have patient with significant um, OSA or severe or at least moderate OSA, my, if the patients want a permanent solution, if they don't want any compliance, you know, treatment like auto appliance or, um, uh, you know, CPAP, if we talk about MMA, I usually think of MMA. The, the, the reason is that I think it's very rare to come up with the patients that only have one dimension at fault. Most of the patients that end up performing MMA are probably some sort of patient that had, you know, mandible hypoplasia, maxillary hypoplasia, or bimax protrusion. It's rare. I only came across just one or two that all other dimensions being normal, except the upper jaw being extremely narrow. So to me, to perform surgically assisted RPE, yes, there are study that supported, and I think they probably uh, report maybe, you know, 10 point reduction in AHI. And I know that the Stanford team has been trying to promote this as uh, DOME. But again, if I'm going to put a patient under, I want something that, that I can make sure that I don't have to go back and do this again. Okay. Another question is, what are the short and the long term effects? of RP on the Asian children also. Do you find any difference in the response between Caucasian and the Asian children? Or do you find any relapse of all side improvement after skeletal relapse? Uh, it's a good question, and I'm not sure that I I I have a you know good scientific answer for you. In just in my observation, I don't I don't think that I see any difference. Um, I I have to mention also that I I in in the U.S. I had more adult patient adult OSA patients than pediatric. Only here in Bangkok, when I came here five years ago, that I began to have many, many more um, pediatric patients. And part of it is because I, I, I was able to work closely with the you know, sleep physicians here, who, um, who also a, a sleep physician at um, the children's hospital close to the dental school where I work. Um, but um, just to think back at all those cases, I'm, I'm not sure if I noticed any difference. Okay. The last question what's, is- What's your take um, though? I'm curious the about last your one. What's your opinion regarding dental infection on OSA? 
Um, so the evidence, it's probably, you know, um, favor on the side that, you know, extraction of four bicuspid probably doesn't cause um, OSA. I, I do think, I, I actually think I subscribe to that. However, um, in regard to OSA, we're talking about iatrogenic, right? So we're talking about something that we can potentially cause. And again, OSA is something that doesn't show up right away. You, you, you know, treat a patient in their, you know, teenage years, and then, um, you know, you, you don't know what they, what they going to be in their, in their, let's say, 40, in their 50. What if they gain a lot of weight? Would it be better if you did non-extraction when they were younger, just in case they gain weight? Uh, so essentially there's a lot of things that, you know, we still don't know, even though, you know, there are several retrospective studies now being published and it does sort of favor, you know, it, it, that it doesn't cause the, the other, the other aspect is that, you know, in, in cases like this, sometimes I, I think a mean just doesn't make sense because let's just say when when you look at the average it it just doesn't have any difference between you know those uh cases that were treated with extraction and non-extraction in terms of an increase in their hi or prevalence of osa but in reality if you if you have only one case that you you know for sure that you have that, let's just say patients, you know, um, reported to you that they experienced the sign and symptom of OSA after orthodontic treatment. It, it, you already, you know, created one and one is one too many, right? As I said, this is iatrogenic. Um, so I, I think um, to answer your question differently is that, what we should do is we should pay more attention to history taking. I, I think, um, uh, you know, it is a good practice to perhaps ask a simple question of, do you snore? Or if you want to go a step further, let's do questionnaires, okay? Mm -hmm. I, I think I can, I can say that my residents ask this kind of questions quite routinely now in, in most of the patients, in most of the new patients. And then if, um, you know, if there are reasons for us to explore further, you know, uh, for instance, referring patients to sleep physicians and all that, then we'll, we'll do so. When I, when I first moved back here, uh, lots of patients that we have in the clinic, they're actually on a referral base, but, you know, more and more we, we do, you know, ask questions and then we found, you know, these patients more and more just from history taking and then refer them to see sleep physicians. So okay, thank you. Summarize, no answer. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Liao. And next, I think we'll go to our Q&A session. Our, our uh, chat room is very active with a lot of questions. So we'll try and get through most of them, if not possible, all of them. So um, our first question is from Dr. Chen. Um, the question is, do you use RME for all maxillary transverse deficiencies or only for patients with um, uh, both transverse deficiency and OSA? I, I use them in uh, pretty much all of my patients if there is a, a you know, transverse maxillary deficiency. However, there are many designs of um, an RPE. Um, so, um, you know, I would uh, just pick and choose just based on the indication, but I, I do not use an expansion plate and I'm actually not a big fan of a quad helix. And our next question is from Dr. Choi. 
Um, the question is, do you perform mandibular expansion after RME? No, personally, no. Although I saw some study reporting a concurrent expansion of the maxilla and, um, um, and the use of the Schwartz appliance to um, expand the lower arch. With, with the lower arch, you can't really expand because there is no you know, suture. If you really want to do it, that means you have to do some physio, uh, uh distraction. What you do with the Schwartz appliance in the lower, it's basically you just up, upright the, um, you know, the lower teeth, especially the you know, lower posterior teeth. You don't really get a skeletal expansion. But with the upper, what I'm really hoping for is the skeletal expansion. Um, so no, I do not perform the expansion of the lower arch. And next we have several questions from Dr. Yimi. So we'll go through them one by one. The first question is, um, since adenal tonsillectomy is some consider it to be the first line of treatment for pediatric OSA, um, do you usually consult with ENT doctors or do you feel if that's necessary at all prior to starting an RPE treatment? As I said, I don't perform my own um, you know, diagnosis, I refer that to the, you know, sleep physicians that I work with. Um, uh, so I do work more closely with the sleep physician rather than the, um, you know, ENT. But um, if you recall my um, presentation that in, you know, based on, you know, the, the um, evidence that we have currently, it actually doesn't really matter whether you you expand first or you do you know adenotonsillectomy first. However, in in reality, some of these patients that were referred to me was because um, uh, first of all, there are not that many pediatric ENT working in Thailand. So there is a long list of patients and they actually have to wait for six to 12 months. At least that's that's what I was told before they could get a surgery. Um, and they got sent to me is because some of them just don't want to wait and they, they want to see if there's anything that can be done. And the next question is, do you have any experience with MARPE, uh, mini screw assisted RPE? Um, no, I, I, I don't use it. Um, I, I just don't see, well, let me rephrase it. Uh, I do have little experience. I, I, there were occasions that I don't want to put the band directly on the teeth because um, this patient had tons of missing teeth and the current primary teeth they just didn't have, um, you know, the long route to support. So little experience, um, but that's actually not the case that has OSA on top of that. Um, but if the question was rephrased to, do you, I think the uh, MAPE or, um, you know, SME or any sort of, you know, um, mini screw assisted RPE is needed, uh, my answer is that not based on my clinical experience and also um, according to the literature, so, so all those studies that we have, either retrospective or prospective, they perform just regular RPE. Okay. And the next question is, have you ever encountered an incidence where the palatal is so narrow that you cannot place an, R an RPE? I think you won't find any narrower palate than the patient with Schwartz jam. <laughs> I, I don't think you will ever find one. I, I promised you that. Um, we, you know, thankfully we, we do have intraoral scanner in, in our department. So we don't have to do um, impression taking and you know, without intraoral scanner, it will be impossible for me to do anything for this child because he, he could not open his mouth that wide at all because of the contraction of his muscle. And you, you see my thumb, I, mean, I can show you again, this is my thumb and it is this wide. So I can't imagine that you will see anything narrower than that case. That is the narrowest um, maxilla that I've ever seen in my life. 
And our next question is from Dr. Natalia. And the question is, um, what can you propose for children with Pierre Robin C uh, syndrome? Um, you know, if you need to expand, and most likely you you will need to expand. But you know, with syndromic patients, they always a tend to be worse. Their HI number tend to be higher. So with syndromic patients, I I I would say <clears throat> you probably need. Um, some sort of surgical treatment as well. For instance, you might need to perform surgical mandibular advancement. So um, I, I think craniofacial syndrome, it's a different ball game. Okay, uh, and our <laughs> last question is from Dr. Pryor. And I just like to invite Dr. Pryor to ask the question herself since you're a speaker that um, we've been able to connect through Dr. Pryor. So I think I'll let her ask the question herself. Dr. Pryor? Hello, Dr. Pryor. Okay, Junior, please. <laughs> okay, I'll ask the question then. Um, do you have any opinion on the use of endoscopic assisted surgical expansion? I'm not sure what that is, to be honest. Endoscopic maxillary expansion? Uh, I guess so. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know what that is, endoscopic maxillary expansion. Okay, because I, I have no idea as well, so. <laughs> <laughs> we have very few experience on this. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, so I think that Dr. Pryor, okay. Prior now is online. Please, okay, there we uh, go. can you explain the question by yourself, Dr. Prior, please? Uh, sorry, Pryor, I forgot to open go. the mic. <laughs> okay, uh, I just read a, a read, uh, article from Dr. KCV, and he said about uh, comparing between these devices and their um, maxillary expansion. And he just created a new device. It's called like endoscopically assistant surgical expansion. It's a kind of uh, expander, but uh, the patient need to got their like general anesthesia and did the device. It's a kind of the expander, but I mean like, I'm not sure like if I, meet the, the patient, like if I graduate and I meet the patient, what I should consider to use the, I don't know how to say like, to use the expander first, or I need to consider about the other, uh, another treatment device. And if I consider to do the mechanic for the maxillary expander, should I use the, uh, RPE or this device that I read from uh, Dr. KCV? Um, so I, I think, you know, for, for the audience who doesn't know Dr. Casey, he's a surgeon at Stanford, a sleep, you know, surgeon. I think he does lots of, uh, you know, MMA. And I think he's the one that's trying to, uh, you know, promote the surgically, surgically assisted RPE and in, yes, in yes, the team yes. they call it DOME. Uh, my understanding of his technique is that he had some sort of modification that tried to minimize the decision. Um, but I can't imagine that the design of the expander will be that different. Um, he perhaps maybe use a design that is anchored to the palate itself without you know, involving the teeth and, and in general, it looks a little bit smaller. Could it be why it's called microscopic? Microscopic, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Um, but uh, um, I, I just need to look at the device, but I, I can't imagine it would look, you know, drastically different from, you know, whatever that's available in the market currently, especially, you know, one of those um, mini screw assisted RPE uh, type. Um, and the second part of your question, I, 
um, generally, you know, for me, the transverse dimension is the, the first dimension that I would address uh, in terms of orthodontic patients. Um, but as far as, you know, choosing between a, you know, classic treatment and modern intervention, uh, I think here is my advice to all the residents, don't jump on the first bandwagon. Uh, make sure that you have all the evidence supporting your um, treatment or at least good, good, you know, amount of evidence supporting what you do before you would jump on that um, band, you know, wagon. So that's just my advice in general. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, for your quick explanation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Pryor. And uh, after the QA sessions, I would like to invite all our participants to show your face uh, in the screen. Especially, I have to pay my great gratitude to Professor Supakit. Thank you again. And they're very nice to understand and they're very clearly to know what you are talking about, even though I'm not an orthodontist, but you experience every detail very clearly to make me more understood for all the detail how to diagnose it for a kid with the obstructive sleep apnea. By the way, I am very lucky to know you are my senior in UT Southwestern and the Dallas Children's. Yeah. I hope I we can see uh, in person soon and uh, yeah in the I, I I hope so now that the world has opened up again and hopefully I'll be able to <laughs> Changgang forum again in the in the near future. Yeah, thank you. And before the QA session, I will introduce our next speaker in the coming week. That is Professor Fayas, our very very good friend. And Professor Fayez will give us a one lecture to uh, illustrating and show a video demonstration how to harvest the pharyngeal flap for a palate uh, defect patient. And uh, he will show the speech sample before and after the pharyngeal flap. Yeah. Hello, Professor Fayez. How are you? Yeah, very much fine. Okay, thank you. We'll see you soon next coming Sunday. Yeah. Okay, it's time. And I will count to three and uh, come on, please turn on your face and uh, please give me your smile. Count to three and uh, give me a cheese, okay? One, two, cheese. 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 And, uh, let me turn to the second page. Okay, once again, one, two, cheese. Okay, thank you. Thanks again, Professor Superkit, and thank you for all your coming. Uh, we are so lucky, every audience and every participant to have uh, Professor Superkit here with us. See you next week, and good morning, and good evening. See you soon. Bye-bye. Right. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Take Professor care. Have Supakit. a good night. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay, thank you, Junior. Okay, thank you. Okay, see you next week. See ya, bye-bye. Bye-bye.